Welcome to BizTax Enterprise Technology Show, the show where we feature enterprise technology companies operating across Asia, talking about their businesses and solutions and how they make a difference to their customers. Now, today our conversation is with Eddie Stefanesco, General Manager Asia Pacific in Japan at Karoti, and Vijay Iyer, Regional Vice President Solutions and Engineering for APJ. Now, Karoti is in the industrial cybersecurity space. Now, Eddie and Vijay, welcome to the show. Brian, well, thank you very much for having us on. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure indeed, Brian. Very good to be here. Thank you so much for inviting us. Now, I want to start with Eddie. Eddie, give us an overview of, of what you do and also a perspective of your history. Sure. So uh, Clarity typically offers uh, cybersecurity solutions, which address the unique challenge of industrial control systems, um, allowing engineers, operators, cybersecurity prof professionals to protect their most complex industrial networks. I guess as, as operational technology, such as control system networks for factories and power generation plants become increasingly connected to IT systems, um, there's a real risk of cyber attacks. Essentially, we're bridging the gap between IT and OT cybersecurity to help organizations safeguard their operations um, while ensuring they're reaping the benefits of any connectivity that's now required. Now, could you give us um, an overview of some of the products and services that you offer your clients? Sure. So from a product perspective, uh, we have two main products, uh, which is our Clarity CTD, which is a, is a, a continuous threat detection um, product. This allows um, customers to get complete visibility um, of, of the um, infrastructure in their OT network. It also provides them with vulnerability information on that infrastructure and any potential threats. The second part of the equation is um, allowing them secure, giving them a platform and tool to, to manage the remote access into those networks. Um, ever increasingly, um, the need for remote access into those networks, especially with, with COVID having, um, you know, put our world at a standstill in many, in many environments. Um, being able to control who has access into my network and into the OT network and what they can access is, is becoming even more critical. Um, from a service perspective, obviously, we, we work with the customers to ensure that, that these products get installed, configured, operational, operationalized. Um, and we do this ourselves, but we, but we also typically rely on our um, extensive partner network across the APJ region to, to get this done. Okay. okay, Vijay, could you give us an example of how customers actually use your products? If you think about uh, the fact that uh, most of the customers that we work with have these industrial environments, and, and that's absolutely mission critical for them. Uh, the way they will use the product is firstly to make sure that they have the eyes and ears on these networks 24 by 7 so that they can flag out any anomalies, any threats. They can not just do that, but by really having a deep understanding of what is out there, they are able to even unearth the weaknesses and the vulnerabilities within those uh, assets and networks uh, which are running their operational facilities, the very critical ones. And like Eddie has said, you know, the platform also enables them to make sure that now their employees that have gotten remote increasingly due, due to COVID-19 and their contractors and service providers are able to make a very controlled access into those environments to manage uh, repairs or you know any updates to those critical human machine interfaces that are needed to keep these facilities running okay eddie i want to uh, uh, zoom in on you and you know in the past 18 months or so um covid has basically changed the way many of your customers operate how have you helped them to ensure that they are up to mark in terms of remote access capabilities and uh, protecting their operational technology networks? Yeah, great, great question, Brian. So, you know, COVID has caused a lot of issues, um, not only for their own internal staff being able to operate their, their OT network, but also for third party contractors. Um, that typically have to do all the upgrading and updates to any of the, the um, equipment inside those um, plants. So by giving, by allowing customers to use secure remote access, um, it means that connection is still available into the mission critical side of, of the network, allowing us, again, as VJ and I've said, you know, um, allowing for updates or allowing for productivity to continue, um, even from, you know, from, from the base of their home. Um, it's been extremely critical for these organisations. Um, you know, OT networks are different to IT networks. They can't afford any downtime. 
um, they're mission critical. Um, you know, if you, if you think about the amount of people that have had to work from home during the COVID crisis, um, ensuring um, power, water, gas continues to be to su supplied to, to homes um, is obviously of utmost importance. So we, we've helped organisations um, continue, continue to, do, to be able to do that. Yeah, in fact, Brian, if I can just add to some of the great points that Eddie's uh, made right. Uh, when you think about COVID-19 and correlate that with the biggest concerns that these clients have brought to us, and, and, and one of the reasons they have brought these concerns to us is, if you think about the traditional remote access solutions, many of them are designed for the IT networks in mind and perspective. Now, what the Clarity SRA, which Eddie spoke about, does is it tackles the OT remote access challenges very well, be it the service providers or be it even the remote employees. So what, and that's because it's converging, right? Yeah, and and it's 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 enabling that ITOT convergence in terms of how it embraces that, and importantly, then infuses the security principles and the granular controls that we want, and then reduces the OT's exposure to the risks that stem from this unmanaged, uncontrolled, or insecure access. So the key points that customers have in mind when they talk to us and when they call us is, can I make it role-based? Can I make it policy-based? Can I make it least privileges? Can I induce two-factor authentication, multi-factor authentication, live over-the-shoulder monitoring, session recording, many zero-trust controls? These are the key areas where Clarity is helping these clients. Okay, now, Eddie, I want to ask you, in the Asia-Pacific region, which are the sectors that you've seen the biggest adoption of your products and services? And, and perhaps you can explain also which countries uh, have also embraced your solution. Sure. Yeah. So look, um, we're continuously growing through oil and gas, utilities, manufacturing, um, water, electrical power industries. Um, and we've seen a, a, a huge increase into the food and beverage sector. Um, starting to see more proliferation into what we class as building management systems or critical building management systems. So if you think about HVAC systems into data centers um, that, are, that, are needing to be, that are needing to be protected, um, for, it, it's been a widespread, uh, you know, I can't, I won't, I won't pinpoint one country over another across APJ. We're, we're getting an even spread from um, all the way down in Australia and New Zealand, um, up to Korea and across to India. Um, it's really dependent on, on, on sectors in, in each. So manufacturing in India has been um, huge for us. Um, utilities in Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Australia have all been very strong and, and food and beverage throughout all of those countries that I mentioned. Okay, Vijay, then given those sectors in mind, what differentiates Karoti from other specialists who implement cybersecurity for operational technology networks? What is your secret sauce? Why, If I'm a CIO, why should I buy... Uh, your products? Wow. Now, oh, great question, Brian. Uh, yes, and uh, I pretty much welcome that. You see, one of the key differentiators that Clarity has is the Clarity platform itself. Now, why I say that is because look at the key concerns and the top concerns that uh, many of these critical infrastructure uh, clients have running these OT environments. They are thinking hard about how do I continuously have a very watchful eye on those networks. So we are talking continuous monitoring. And they're also, like we discussed, you know, thinking about uh, secure remote access. They are thinking about addressing vulnerabilities, threats, and even the segmentation requirements of that environment. Now, uniquely, the overarching nature of the Clarity platform is that it is able to spread itself across these exact top three, top four, main requirements that OT environments have and which these clients are bringing on to us, right? That overarching reach itself is a differentiator and it's extremely crucial to OT. The depth of visibility that we actually achieve with our platform in those environments is again something that you know, projects clarity as a market leader in this particular space because it's very specialized, especially those OT networks, those hardware, software, and the bunch of out there. And that, that's an area that we really specialize in. But it's not just with the technology. If you look at 
the team of clarity, the people who then take that technology and guide the clients towards it, that specialized knowledge and experience which clarity brings in to implement that into those uh, industrial networks is a very key differentiator. And, and if I have to actually finish off, I shouldn't, you know, not mention clarity's research team. We've really got an award-winning research team, a very unique differentiator because the, the more busy, the more active and, you know, the, the quality of the research team directly tells you about the differentiation you bring through the threat intel that you pack in with the software. Be, and, and these threat intels need to be regularly updated. You cannot have one set of a threat identifying mechanism and say that I'm good for the next one year or for the next two years or so, right? Because uh, signatures are evolving. The methodologies used by the adversaries are evolving. Evolving, CVs or what is called as the vulnerabilities and exposures that are globally published are also evolving and 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 you know newer ones are getting found as we speak so you need that differentiator in the research team as well to bring in the entire thing as a package differentiation uh, of quality to the clients mm. okay, Brian, and Brian and Brian and Sophie, if I can just add to that you know sure. it, it, it's okay as a vendor for us to talk about our secret sauce and what makes us different <laughs> but I think I think the validation came also in the recent Forest Away report that was released in November, the first of its kind in the OT security space, where we were we were announced the the, the clear the clear leader. We we top ranked in twelve of the sixteen criteria, um, putting us as, as as the clear choice um, in the mind of third party analysts. So um, it's not just. It's just not clarity that is going to tell you that we've got a secret source and, and we're the best product out there. It's, <laughs> it's been valid. It's been validated by third party analysts, which is um, which is great to see. Okay. Good call. Uh, what I want to ask both of you is also this. Now, there's a heightened awareness now of cybersecurity because of the threats to critical infrastructure and industries, everything from telecommunications, finance, energy. In fact, talking about energy, I think just a couple of days ago, there was a ransomware attack on an Australian utility. Now, what are your thoughts in terms of the changes that you've seen uh, in terms of priorities, uh, in terms of spending and practices and regulations that companies are starting to put on, on cybersecurity and this space? I mean, Eddie, if it's okay, I can take that. I can start off. Go for it, Richard. <laughs> so one of the things, Brian, that we are seeing in, especially in recent times, uh, and, and thankfully so, OT cybersecurity is getting regularly and hotly discussed in several high level meetings that the companies have. So what that tells us is that companies are increasingly prioritizing OT cybersecurity. They are approving budgets that are specific to OT cybersecurity. We have witnessed this change, especially in the last couple of years, and we continue to see this change and that's a very positive move. Now, when you talk about regulations, what we are also seeing is that the regional uh, agencies are increasingly assessing how to mandate incident reporting procedures uh, and installation of the cybersecurity practices for companies, uh, especially in certain sectors, like you mentioned critical infrastructure. Yes, true. So if you consider our own uh, your Singapore uh, cybersecurity agency, which is where Eddie and I, I mean, are based out of, they have drafted a master plan for OT cyber resilience. And it's also installing an expert panels to advise, you know, on, on that master plan. Uh, they have drafted the CCOP, which is the cybersecurity code of practice, which are guidelines for critical infra. If you just look back, not uh, too much in the past, just the last couple of weeks, Australia's uh, SOCI, uh, Security of Critical Infrastructure, Act, you know, that expanded the scope of what they would really consider as falling under the critical infrastructure, and they included a lot of additional names. So we, we are seeing these changes definitely happening from a regulation standpoint, from the uh, intent standpoint of the enterprise companies, and even from a good practices standpoint, we are seeing that companies with OT environments are gravitating towards OT purpose-built cybersecurity tools and frameworks. Okay, so Vijay, I want to take you up on, on uh, the next level on that, because unlike the financial services industry, which has very strict compliance guidelines and so forth uh, issued <laughs> by the authorities, 
incident reporting and cybersecurity practices uh, reporting are not mandatory in many markets. Singapore is probably a leader, mm -hmm. but many markets, it's not even a, re a statutory requirement to, to, I mean, you could basically be uh, 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 under a ransomware attack, you've paid the you've paid the, the, the your your bad actors you don't even have to report that what's your view on the direction of standards in reporting and uh, cyber security practices wow so i mean something tells me that's going to be the toughest question i'm going to face this morning but uh, and, and also you just... Eddie, you've got a you, you're not dodging this question as well you've got to answer that <laughs> now, I, okay but I'll, I'll give you my viewpoint of this right because it's a fantastic question you're absolutely spot on right it's still not mandated uh, in in quite a few countries uh, but you know things are transitioning there's a lot of deliberation there's a lot of discussion since you asked for my opinion I would like to say yes. Why? Uh, for one, it bolsters the ability to help prevent cyber attacks by building better awareness of the existing threat landscape and also the actors uh, that execute them. So essentially, imagine, uh, just consider this, you are now through this reporting, getting a fuller picture of the cyber threats and the indicators of compromise with a better understanding of how the cyber criminals operate. And, and who knows, reporting can even help prosecute cyber criminal gangs. Yes. So when you, when you actually look at the flip side of it, the main pushbacks are going to come from organizations feeling that, uh, is this going to lead to some reputational damage or is it going to be a distraction to my incidents response process, which is actually very important. But when you, you know, count away that with the benefits, the benefits are available for all. And that is key. Without the mandates, organizations would rather have somebody else report and share their own incident. And, <laughs> you know, I, if you just look at what might happen in case of non-reporting, uh, there is also one other interesting thing that came to my mind. Cyber criminals may get encouraged. Lack of information actually works in favor of the attackers who can look for the subsequent victims and even the threat intelligence efforts by the so-called defenders can get very slowed down, right? So I'm all for such mandates of reporting, understanding that it's a delicate topic where the ecosystem really needs to come together to understand the bigger picture and the greater good. Um, Eddie, any, any thoughts on that matter? Yeah, look, I think it's I think it's maturing, Brian. So you know, even even in the IT world, it, it took a while to, to to bring in mandating of um, reporting any cyber attacks. So I think if if you have a look at what's happening through um, the US and the attacks that they had last year on an, on another critical infrastructure sites, um, the move there to to sort of bring in um, the reporting, it, it, it's flowing down to, to to other countries. But I think it, it's it's going to evolve in in time. I, I, similar to what VJ says, I think. Um, it, it should, it, it needs to be done. Um, it's just a matter of timing and when it, this, this gets enforced. Now, um, gentlemen, and both of you can take this question. What are some key uh, trends that you see in operational technology, cybersecurity markets, uh, not only globally, but within the Asia Pacific region in the next uh, two years? Trends, I think the biggest trends is digitization, right? And connection to the internet, especially in the manufacturing space where we're moving into a smart factory world, um, smart cities and all those sort of things. So I think, you know, um, once once you've got connection to the internet, um, obviously this brings risks. If, you, if you've got to remember when traditional OT environments and plants were built, they weren't built with security in mind. Um, they're built with um, uptime, right? Keeping them running, keeping them keeping them going. So, you know, the biggest the, the biggest move we're seeing is what I'm seeing is that that move to digitization. Um, how about you, Vijay? Anything to add to that? Uh, yes. Uh, so it, it, maybe a couple of points that I can add is we are seeing a very strong growth uh, trajectory, which is coming from power, oil and gas, utilities, distribution, automotive, mining, and smart cities like what Eddie said. And we are expecting that trend to continue. Um, some market research companies have really you know, stated that the both the growth as well as the 
total value, estimated value of this OT cybersecurity market is upwards of 18 billion, which uh, essentially is, is quite a huge number. But in terms of the trends, uh, currently not looking too much, except for 2020 and 2021, to build that current context. Um, you know that ransomware is very hot on the minds of everybody. We have seen why, and we have seen those incidents happen. Uh, with Oldsma Florida water hack, we have also seen how uh, you know less secure remote access can lead to almost the poisoning of water which happened out there. There is a supply chain attack, and Solar Winds is the biggest name that uh, you know sunburst which comes uh, to mind. So there is not just an active landscape, but there is this diversity. As a trend, we are expecting this active landscape as well as the diversity to continue. Uh, in the in the immediate future. And on the vulnerabilities front, uh, Clarity Research regularly conducts uh, biannual vulnerability landscape studies. So it is it is a foregone conclusion that uh, uh, you know the industrial control systems are going to be even more increasingly targeted as we see the trend really uh, surge. And the vulnerability landscape is also going to evolve. We see the likes of Ripple 20 and Urgent 11. If I just correlate this back to 2020 and 2019, then mm -hmm. such vulnerabilities to actually high profile vulnerabilities will continue to get published is, is what, we, uh, what we see as a trend. Um, remote access also as a trend is going to continue to be sought after, especially because if you look on the attack side, RDP attacks have grown by more than a few hundred percent. Uh, remote access Trojans have grown up. So, and, and that all falls back and correlates back to what's really happening with the pandemic and where it is pushing these organizations. Now, are these increased attacks, Vijay, also uh, driven by the fact that uh, the criminals have now seen that this is a very fertile market for them in terms of revenue yeah absolutely so now uh eddie i want to now zoom in on the company itself could okay. you give us a perspective of your growth and revenue and headcount within the region over the past year sure so um from a from a um, headcount perspective across apj we've nearly tripled um in staff um and that's across um, several countries through APJ, um, as mentioned before. Um, won't give you the exact revenue number um, <laughs> for a private company, but I can tell you that um, from the first half of 2020 to the first half of 2021, we've, we've grown in around by about 250% in revenue um, across APJ, which, is, which has been um, a, a huge performance from our perspective. Yeah, congratulations. And you've also just raised 400 million in a Series E funding and also entered into an agreement to acquire Medigate Tech Limited, a, a leading healthcare IoT company. Um, tell us about your funding round and uh, about some of your investors, including SoftBank. Sure. So this is actually the second funding round this year. Um, we, we received 140 million in, in Series D funding um, earlier this year in June, which actually saw us open up our Singapore regional headquarters. Um, but just on Wednesday this week, we did announce um, the, uh, the funding of 400 million. And really, you know, we're very excited about this and we're extremely proud because it's gonna help us with our, our mission um, to sort of secure all what we're gonna term as the cyber physical systems across industrial, healthcare and enterprise environments. And, and we're, gonna, we're gonna start using the term extended internet, extended internet of things or XIOT. Um, in, in, in that, we basically had um, the series of e-funding was, was co-led by SoftBank, as you mentioned, as well as some of our existing um, investors such as Bessemer, Schneider, um, plus Astari. Astari is actually a global cybersecurity platform that's actually been established by Tomasic here in Singapore. Um, Team 8 Standard Investments also participated. In it. But really, what we're trying to do here in combining the clarity and mitigate sort of domain expertise um, into a single platform, we're going to really be taking a giant leap forward on, a, on our mission to secure ev everything, so ever-expanding universe um, for connected organisations. Um, our vision is a future where cyber and physical worlds safely connect to support our lives um, with such a strong sort of backing from, the, from all these great investors on our side. Um, on SoftBank side, 
And I think from SoftBank's perspective, their investment into, into Clarity was um, really because they saw our leadership um, in, our, in our vertical um, and, and our vision that I just mentioned before. They're very aligned with that. And Yossi Cohen from, from the investment side of, of SoftBank is also joining our board, um, you know, of, to quote to quote his statement in our in our recent press release where he stated you know our clarity's technology addresses a high stake problem in enabling enabling safe digital transformation um, and we're eager to partner with them with them in its journey to protect the critical infrastructure that is the foundation of of uh, ai revolution so you know it's it's fantastic to have softbank on not only as an investor uh, but as but a strong partner in our in our push forward in in opening up in uh, the japan market so in, in that watch with that war chest, what are you going to do with it in 2022 in Asia Pacific region? Yeah, so we'll we'll continue to invest in in staff across um, all sectors, not just the go to market side, but it, it's important that we have the right support infrastructure um, to support our customers and our partners. Um, we will heavily invest into our partners and our partner our partner program, which is is critical to our success, um, and and we'll continue to grow. Now, Eddie Vijay, thank you very much for taking your time to be on the show. Thanks, Brian. It's an absolute Thanks. pleasure. It was indeed. And thank you so much for inviting us. Have a great day, Brian. Thank you. I'm Brian Fernandez, and I've been speaking to Eddie Stefanisco, General Manager of Asia Pacific and Japan, and Vijay Iyer, Regional Vice President, Solutions Eng Engineering, Asia Pacific and Japan at Claroti on Bistex Enterprise Technology Show. This video and podcast will be on our various social media platforms, as well as our website, www.bistex.asia. Please like and subscribe to our various platforms. Thank you very much for tuning in.